Hello, everyone. I'm Pamela Rickia from Living Joyfully, and I'm joined by my co-host, Anna Brown, and our guest, Living Joyfully Network member, Sarah Davidson. Hello to you all. Hello. <laughs> so on today's episode, we have invited Sarah to join us in talking about a topic that she's been exploring deeply recently, which is consent. And I think this will be a really fun and interesting conversation. Now, just before we get started, have you checked out the Living Joyfully shop yet? Our online shop has my unschooling books, lots of helpful coaching options, and online courses such as Navigating Conflict, Validation, and Four Pillars of Unschooling. You can also learn more about the Living Joyfully Network there. We are excited to be creating a one-stop shop to support you on your unschooling journey, and we hope you'll check it out at livingjoyfullyshop.com. So with that done, Sarah was first on the podcast a couple of years ago in episode 312, which we will link in the show notes. I encourage all our listeners to check out that episode and learn more about her journey to unschooling. And we are very thrilled to have you back, Sarah. It has been such a pleasure getting to know you on the network these last few years. So I was just wondering, can you give us a bit of an update just to get the conversation started? Like, how old are your kids now? Oh, sure. Yeah, I'd love to give an update. So I have, I believe last time we spoke on the podcast, my kiddos were 9 and 11. And now they are 12 and 14. So, um, <laughs> and as far as, I went in the, the last podcast episode, I talked about all the non-human animals that were part of our family, and those have not changed, except for we have one addition. Um, we rescued a bunny along the side of the road a couple of months ago and ended up adopting them, and they are bun-bun, and they are a force of nature, and we love them, but they've been quite an adventure. <laughs> so they're our newest addition and kind of like our only animal addition. Um, and then so so Ryan and Izzy um, are my two kiddos, and they have just been, oh my gosh, they have grown and changed so much. Some things have stayed the same, yet they're also com almost completely different people <laughs> than they were the last time um, I was a guest. Uh, so Ryan, they st he still really loves gaming. He's into Roblox, Obbies, and Total War, Warhammer 3, and Family Among Us. Um, but what's new is he's just recently, like within the last year and a half, he started going on all my Saturday morning walks with the dog, which has led to this love of birding. So he and I are really adamant or I don't know, really passionate birders. And we use this Merlin app to identify all the birds in our area. Um, and he also last year started getting interested in running. Um, and so he set up his own kind of training programs and he's now run three 5k races, um, kind of all on his own, which has been really fun to watch. And he's also, uh, started getting into football and he's thinking kind of playing around with the idea of playing like a tackle league football, which would be kind of the first organized sport that he's ever done if he decides to do that. So that's really cool. Um, Izzy's 14. I don't know if I mentioned Ryan was my 12 year old, but Izzy's 14. Um, she's really into Microsoft Flight Simulator, still very passionate about uh, aviation, just like last time. Um, she's been running her own Discord server with some other kind of homeschooling, unschooling kids that has like a Minecraft server associated with that. And so that's really fun for them. So airplanes, 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 everything <laughs> airplanes, uh, whether it's airport, the logistics behind it, the flying, everything. Um, she's into that. And then also into traveling. Uh, recently started getting into uh, planning for a future car and driving has been really like an exciting kind of prospect for them. Um, and current events and politics and riding their bikes. So those are kind of Izzy's interests right now which is really fun nice. <laughs> yeah and then joe and i are relatively i don't know joe's still into fortnite he plays fortnite he's still into soccer but last time we talked it was the german soccer league and now he's shifted to the italian soccer league <laughs> as his passion um and he likes building stuff with his hands and then for me right now what's bubbling um is like gardening. I have started all my seeds from from seed, uh, which I've never done before, and um, birding, and uh, watercolor, and let's see, um, yeah, stuff like that. And I just wanted to mention, like as a family, so those are kind of 
um, individual interests that have some overlap between family members. Um, as a family unit, we are loving Exploding Kittens, which is this uh, oh, tablet kind yeah. of based game. Poetry for the Neanderthal, Neanderthals, which is um actual physical card game. Um, and we recently discovered that oranges and cream taste amazing together, like whipped cream with oranges. And so now we've been having oranges and cream tea parties. <laughs> and I don't know if that's going to become a tradition, but I don't know. It's been really fun. So I love that. There's so many fun things. And it's been fun to kind of watch the different interests ebb and flow and I don't know I love it I always enjoy the updates and and what's happening with you all doing all kinds of fun stuff I will pop up to say the oranges yeah. like last yeah. week uh Mike and Jules made like an it's a like an orange based salad but oranges and marshmallow oh, and yeah. and some cream in there and some pineapple and coconut anyway so there there's a little it's similar my mom, there. My yeah. mom makes that it's it, it, that's a southern thing so that's oh, interesting yeah. <laughs> here that's considered a southern thing so that's so mm-hmm. funny but I remember it from childhood had a lot going on for me at the time so <laughs> it was like <laughs> but I love that. Oh my goodness. Okay. So we're going to dive right in because I'm very excited. Um, you have mentioned recently at on the network and to us that um, you've been exploring consent and willingness and kind of how those two things weave together and all the little things that kind of surround that. And I was wondering if you could just, you know, share some of your exploration around that and what tools you found helpful and just, you know, kind of the paradigm and the mindset, because I think it's been an interesting journey from what I've heard already. And I'm excited to, to kind of talk about it with you. Yes, I think so. I just wanted to start with why consent has is such an interesting topic for me and why it feels so important. And I feel like it's one of those cornerstones to when we talk about building space for these connected relationships that we want to have with our, well, with our immediate family and then ultimately with the world, but let's just keep it the immediate family for now. That that consent and willingness is the cornerstone of that. And that the best and just most amazing and richest learning happens in that space of willingness and consent when that's happening. And so um, I've found a couple of tools that have been really helpful for me in kind of, I I like to, I don't know, they have things that order my brain a little bit. And the main tool, I have three that I'll kind of touch on probably while we're talking, but the main one Um, that I wanted to mention was the framework for consent that was created by um, a sex researcher named Emily Nagoski, who wrote the book, Come As You Are. And I encountered this framework um, through, and actually through Angela Chen's work, who wrote, who was the author of ACE. Um, And so um, Emily Nagoski developed some categories for consent um, that went along the lines of this enthusiastic, willing, unwilling, and coerced consent. Um, And what helped me with that is, first of all, I know Emily Nagoski was specifically writing this framework for physical touch and intimacy, but I feel like it really does, can expand outward to pretty much all relational kind of interactions. And it gave me this more nuanced framework for consent beyond this binary, like, yes, I'm consenting or no, I'm not, which Mm -hmm. can feel really like black and white and confusing at times, when there's so much of life that actually occurs in kind of a gray area. And so if it's okay, I'd like to go ahead and just so we have like a common language. Um, I did adapt some of the um, kind of the definitions for each of these categories um, to make them a broader kind of beyond just the physical touch and to a broader extent. Um, But I'd like to go through each of those four categories if that's okay. Yeah, Um, absolutely. (laughs) So the first was enthusiastic consent. And I'm going to read from my notes here. So it's when when I want something for my own reasons, because it brings me joy, when I don't fear the consequences of saying yes, or saying no, when saying no means missing out on something I want. So that's enthusiastic consent. Willing consent would be when I may care about something, but I don't need to do it right now when I would not otherwise choose it for myself, but I'm willing because someone else wants it and it's okay with me. 
when I'm pretty sure saying yes will have an okay result. And I think maybe I'd regret if, regret saying no, or when I believe that the desire to do something might begin after I say yes. So that would be the willing consent area. And then the, the next two actually, um, Angela Chen was really clear to point out that these next two categories of willing, unwilling consent and coer coerced consent are only consent in the most literal sense that someone yeah. did not yell out no. Um, right. But there, for, for unwilling consent, it's when I fear the consequences of saying no more than I fear the consequences of saying yes. When I feel not just an absence of desire to do something, but an absence of desire for desire. When I hope that by saying yes, you'll stop bothering me or think that if that if I say no, you'll only keep trying to persuade me. So that was the unwilling consent. Yeah. And for coerced consent, we get into threat when you threaten me with harmful consequences if I say no, when I feel I'll be hurt if I say yes, but that I'll be hurt more if I say no. Mm -hmm. And when saying yes means experiencing something I actively dread. So those are the four, that's the framework. And, and in my parenting journey, I have experienced or all of those, and I would like to kind of touch on kind of how that's shown up for me yeah. and kind of um, what I am trying to foster in my family and then sometimes where I'm, I get a little tripped up. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah, I think I really... There was a few places where I was vigorously naughty, if you're watching on video, <laughs> because there were a couple of pieces. I, I really <laughs> liked the depth to which um, she went like and, and grabbed some of those nuances and, and the frame of the frame through desire for, you know, for the, the more enthusiastic ones. And even and then taking that when when you get down to the to the other two right that are yes I haven't you know said no but the the feelings of coercion and how how I'm framing that in my head like when I'm almost doing that pros and cons of like what are the consequences going to be and even bringing in the consequences of both the yes and the no that's that's really like comparing them really makes it clear, at least for me, what what she's talking about. So I love that. Right. I, I love how it does bring those nuances in because consent was that was a very big guidepost for me early on. Like, you know, we've been talking about autonomy in the network this month, which I found really enjoyable. For me, the word really was consent. But you're right. As a binary, it's a little bit tricky to like fit into life, to explain to people and to understand. And so I really, you know, I it really enjoyed the willingness to definition too, because it's like, oh, okay, right. Like there are times I make choices because you're interested in doing that and you're important to me. And I know I'm not going to be harmed by it. And I want to do that. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is still a consent that feels okay. And then how different that energy is of those lower two on that spectrum of like, oh, we're, we're dipping into this territory of actually, it doesn't feel okay. Yeah. I may have shown up because I feel forced or I feel worried, but it doesn't feel the same. And so I think I just really do love looking at those nuances because that that's really life, right? We have, you know, there's just a lot of nuance. Yes. And I think um, between those top, top two, which were the enthusiastic and willing consent, and then the bottom two, which were the unwilling and coerced consent, it, it really isn't what it looks like, it, what it feels like. And so those top two right. are connecting, we're connecting truly with ourselves, we're connecting truly with the people in front of us, and it builds that relationship and trust. And then once you get moving into those other two, again, it's a feeling because consent yeah. for one person looks completely different than consent for another. But if there's that feeling of like disconnect, then it's like maybe a little red flag that like, oh, did, did we just kind of tip into this area where we're now disconnecting from each other and from ourselves? Yeah. yeah. And I think I think what another piece that's so valuable and it ties in with talking about autonomy this month, too, is that it's not. A, a right, wrong, yes, no. It really is so individual. Right. It's not like, well, this is a situation where 
consent should be just fine. Like we don't need to discuss <laughs> the nuances. Of course you want to come and do X, Y, Z with right. us or, you know, but even just planting that seed that it's a spectrum, that it really is about the individual. And it's really about the moment too. Like that yeah. willingness, like using that framework really brings into, but this is for me right now. Right, right now, this is how it feels to me. And yeah, it is so much about the feeling and the energy because it's so completely individual. It's not about the question at hand, really. Mm-hmm. And so if you all are okay yes, with it. I was going to say, you're going to share some stories? <laughs> yes, I'd like to start like, because I was like, oh, I got stories in every single one of these categories. <laughs> we'll start with the really fun ones, which is like the enthusiastic consent, which is again, where I want something for my own reasons because it brings me joy. And what I experience this for me and for my kids and for my family is like, this is our yes. Like this is our internal, like bright, sparkly, joyful, like, oh, I want that. That is enthusiastic consent. And I've learned how to spot that. I know what that feels like for me inside now. It's really bright. Um, And I can see it on my kids too. Like I can see what does their yes look like in their body language and their facial expressions and their like energy and their voice. And so it's been really fun because unschooling has given us this space to really learn like what is our yes? Like what are we really drawn to? Where's that joy? Where's that sparkle? Um, And then trying to figure out how to go and do that, like continue, like, oh, let's follow that. How can we do that? And maybe we can do that in this moment. Maybe there needs to be some planning that happens. Um, But that's kind of the, uh, those are when you get into the nuances and and, uh, it's really fun. It's really fun. And it's been interesting for me as as a mom, because before unschooling, I didn't even know what my own yes felt like. And so by watching my kids and kind of experiencing that for myself I'm like oh that's what it feels like when I really am enthusiastic about something um and I got a couple like stories but I don't know if you all want to kind of add to that so the fun part the fun part about this yes is we get to follow it in unschooling I feel like we have so much time and space to do that and then sometimes it can feel a little challenging for me when somebody's yes isn't actually like what they say their yes is I actually can't do for them (laughs) in the moment like I remember there was a time when Izzy really wanted to fly like a bird and this was when they were really really young and I hadn't heard about validation and I don't even remember how I necessarily handled it but it felt really hard for me when they're like, mom, I want to fly like a bird. And I was like, they just wanted to take us, you know, go to the front yard, spread their arms out and just fly. (laughs) And I think what my current self would say is like, yeah, that would be a lot of validation. Like, oh my gosh, you just wish you could just go out to the front yard and take off. And it's so frustrating that you can't. And then like that creativity, like, well, you may not be able to fly like a bird, but would you like to watch a video cam of a bird flying? Or maybe we could get you up in an airplane, you know, (laughs) but just something to kind of get those creative juices of like, that yes, as you imagined it can't quite happen. But there are so many other things, both first the validation of like, and that's really hard. And then the, the, like the creativity of like, but how could we, you know, do other things that are also following that kind of yes that you might feel um and then the other piece and this is kind of my last story um on the yes piece that felt um my brain goes kind of to challenges because the the good stuff just feels I don't know it feels (laughs) greased and like things are happening um there have been times where I've experienced an internal yes for something in this case I really wanted to go see my favorite movie in the movie theater And I was just, oh, I just was so drawn to do this. Um, And my kiddos were adamant that I didn't, they did not want me to leave the house. And I tried, you know, all different kinds of things like, okay, how could I honor this? Yes. How could I go actually do this thing that feels really good to me? And through all of the, you know, the kind of back and forth, it became clear to me that it just wasn't going to be something that my kids were going to be okay with. And in that moment, it was really like validating myself on how hard that felt, but then like regrounding in, okay, what are my choices? I could go to this movie and say, forget, you know, forget you guys. I really, 
just have to go, maybe I could choose that. Um, but like just regrounding and what choices do I have? What is my why? Um, and regrounding in like the abundance of time, like yeah. maybe this movie will come back out in 10 years and I'll get to see it then. My kids aren't going to be like this this age forever telling me that they desperately need me to stay in the house. And then for me, I ended up, you know, choosing connection. So I was like, I really have this yes to go do this thing. Yet my connection with my kids and honoring that relationship felt where I needed to actually be and spend my time. So I put the movie aside, but it did feel challenging there for a little bit <laughs> to say that that yes needed to wait. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that enthusiastic. Yes, it is fun. I, I love the point you said early on, like you really had to figure out what that even felt like to you, because I think so many of us, as we, you know, go through the system, we're really so externally focused of like, what do people need from us? What are we supposed to do in this environment? And so I do think it's a process to learn the enthusiastic. Yes. And I feel like my kids really did lead the way for that for me as well, you know? And so I really started to like, oh, that's what it feels like. But you're right. Sometimes there are these limitations or these like, you know, contextual pieces that make that hard in the moment. But I think when we can really, I don't know, ground into it, feel it, check in with our why, like it doesn't have to be a, a negative story. It really is like, and I have a friend that always says like, celebrate the closeness of the match. And so sometimes it's like, oh, okay, I couldn't do it exactly like I thought I could, but I'm going to celebrate that I even figured out this was something that I wanted and that maybe I can do this piece of it or I can do it in a different way. I can watch the movie when it comes on streaming, like whatever that looks like. And so I think it's interesting, you know, just to think about like what that looks like and kind of the spectrum of, of how we react when we have that enthusiastic. Yes. Yeah. I love, I love that you revisited kind of your priorities for yourself because it was still, it's still your choice, right? right. It was still your choice to make. So it was, you know, I see the impact that my choice, that this, my enthusiastic yes choice would have on those around me. And is that something I want to do? And, you know, it, it's still a choice. Like you said, I could have gone and maybe it is. And maybe you do your best to figure out a way that they would be comfortable enough. You know, there's no literal right or wrong in these moments. But yeah, regrounding in the fact that it's, it's our choice and not getting stuck in that yes, no, people are letting me go or not letting me go. This is still back, regrounding in. It's my choice to make. But looking, as Anna was saying, into the context of it all. And is that context or are the consequences of me doing this enthusiastic yes in this moment in our lives with the relationships and the effect that it will have or will likely have on my relationships um, those are all great questions. Like, so when, if we think of it, yes, no, people aren't letting us, we can get very resistant and very tunnel vision on trying to fit, figure out, excuse me, how to convince them to let us do it rather than taking the time to really reground in our choice and see the implications and play it with those and see what's really worth it. So, you know, not choosing in the end doesn't doesn't negate the fact that it was an enthusiastic yes it's embracing that really but embracing it within the bigger picture of our lives and i feel too like i know some people might think that oh you know the the conventional framework oh you gave in you know mm -hmm. they know they can just get mad about something and and you'll change your mind etc and that may even be what it looks like from people looking from the outside, looking in. But like when we recognize that we've grounded in that choice and we have chosen, like you said, to prioritize a relationship and connection and feeling like that was just too much of an impact to follow through on that enthusiastic yes right now. Like, oh my gosh, the, the richness and the experience and the validation, like, like without even words, the validation of who they are and how they're feeling in that moment, just by us saying, okay, I understand, right? Like, and what do they learn taking that forward? Like when the situation may be reversed other times, like that this is a conversation that we are all important 
they know it was an enthusiastic yes because you were trying to do it. So they understand <laughs> that's important to you, right? <laughs> But, and they still, they still yeah. sometimes will be like, "Mom, I'm sorry you didn't get to go to that movie." And yeah. I'm like, "Hey, you know, I was okay. I, I bought it and I watch it whenever I want." And <laughs> so. well, now now you'll get a VR headset, so you feel like you're like sitting in a huge <laughs> movie theater watching. Right. I, I forgot about VR. Wow. Oh my goodness. Um. Well, we can I. That's all I had on the enthusiastic yeah. piece. Um, so I was going to move to the willing consent um, stories. When I, where, so for willing consent, it's when I'm pretty sure saying yes will have an okay result. And I think maybe I'd regret saying no. So this is that kind of more gray area. Yeah. And I feel like how this looks like in, in my family um, is a lot of back and forth. And usually what's happening is one person has an enthusiastic yes for something, yeah. but it involves another person and they're kind of like, nah, I don't really want to do that. And so it, for me, what works best in our family and every family is going to look different is I usually talk to each of my people in their own separate kind yeah. of rooms and I kind of bounce around and I'm like, okay, this person said this. What do you think about that? Does that feel good to you? And I just keep cycling. And sometimes this takes a really, really long time. But I just, um, I tell myself, you know, this is, I think, Pam, you said it once. It's like, this is the time that unschooling takes. It's like, I want to be part of this process because this is where I learn all the juicy, like, details. We really get down to the needs. We really figure out, like, well, why don't you want to go out right now? Is it just because you just don't want to go out at all today? Or do, were you watching this video and there's 15 minutes left? and you just want to finish it, and then you'd be willing, or maybe you want to take your iPad with you, or, you know, so there's just so many different nuances, and so I'm the, like, I'm the hopper that just <laughs> hops around, hops, 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 um, between my three people until we kind of reach this consensus where everyone's like, okay, yeah, I'm good with that, and how this feels in my body, um, the willing consent, is it doesn't feel like this big sparkly yes to me, but it feels light. Like it's like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And it's kind of like, there's no resistance. There's no like heaviness about it. And then I can see that for my kids as well. Like I can see that they're not kind of going, oh, sure. Or, you know, they could have that facial expression where they're just kind of like, ah, oh, whatever. But they're actually like, okay, yeah. And it's this kind of lighter, not sparkly yes, but like an, okay, yeah, I'm good with that. Um, so I just wanted to give like, there, there have been some times where, um, my kiddo, one of my kiddos has had kind of a, a binary just within themselves, even where like they both want to do something and they also don't want to do something. And so I think Anna, you were the one who gave me words for this, where, where I found really helpful also with myself to be like, okay, so a part of you sounds like you really want to do this thing in this way, but it sounds like another part isn't so sure. And so what is this other part that's not so sure? Like, is there something they're worried about or is there something we can do to make that part more comfortable? And so it's kind of like a parts work um, piece. And then the other piece of the the willing consent I wanted to touch on is when there's an actual need, like for instance, for my sparkly, yes, I want to go to the movie. That wasn't an absolute need of mine. I determined yeah. it's like, I don't really need this. It's a really, would be really nice to have, but there are certain things that I needed to leave the house for like food <laughs> um, or to go walk the dog because we had a dog and that dog had needs. And this is how we needed to fill that need. And I had strong resistance for me leaving for those events as well. And it, I had, you know, done some work around that and realized, no, this is actually something that I need to do um, for our family members to keep our household running uh, the way that we need it to run, to keep people fed. And in that instance, and again, I think, Anna, you gave me words for this um, to kind of help somebody who's not in that willingness place yet to say, to validate them and say, you know, I know how hard this is for you, for me, you to have me leave the house. Um, how can we make it easier? Like, is there something that would make you feel more comfortable? Cause I know when I leave, it's hard for you. And so 
it wasn't that I was just, you know, never leaving the house, but it was this delicate kind of acknowledgement that this still isn't okay for this person. And I can let them know, I, I see you, it's not okay for you. But then, you know, we did find ways and it took, I mean, years of iterations of like, what if I went out this way or with this time or called you here or took my pepper spray or, and it was just a, kind of a, an ongoing conversation of like, this is hard for you. How can we make it feel better? That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I love that. Right. Cause I, I, I think Pam, you're going to want to talk about the talking to different people. Cause I know that was a big piece for you. And, and we found that the same, you know, like really not having, it doesn't have to be this big family meeting that we're all kind of hashing out because sometimes I think it's, you know, depending if we're internal, external processors, leaving space for that, you know, and so I love that piece of it. I, of course, love the parts language because I think it does help us identify like, okay, what does that part need to feel better? It gives us a little bit of a focus versus just like, no, and I don't know, and this kind of back and forth of feeling so confused. And so that language has been really helpful for me as well. And so I, I don't know, I love all of those pieces and that creativity to get to the willingness. So yeah, it's not an enthusiastic yes for you to leave, but with some, okay, let's try this, let's try this. It's like, yeah, I'm willing to try that. And I love that you said too, that it changes because we may make agreements and like, okay, all right, I'm willing for you to go with these kind of conditions. And then that this feels better to me. And then it's like, okay, there was still parts that felt hard. So we need to keep tweaking. And I, that's what I love about, um, you know, cause I kind of called it like consensual living, like where we were really just understanding that we're going to figure this out. Like there's lots of solutions to any given problem. And so that trust that we're going to be heard, it's good. We're going to be seen. It's going to be not just ignored or pushed through. I really found that was the fountain of creativity because when those kind of basic needs of trust and being heard were met, then they were much more willing to get into that creative process. But when they were feeling unsteady, you know, and I've seen it in other families where they're not like, I don't know, they're going to just push through it anyway. What difference does it make? You know, you don't see that creativity bubble up. And so it can take a while to build that trust. But I love that kind of description of how you did that. Yeah, I was going to say like that trust and and how that that takes a while to yeah. to cultivate um, the the under the trust that like because they are giving us some trust in situations like you described, Sarah. It, in that okay, like that willingness is a trust that we'll try this and we'll see. It's not like okay. I have just committed to you doing this forever moving forward, no matter how I feel. And so that trust that they didn't just lock themselves into something is huge because, you know, conventionally so often we can just be trying to convince them to let us do the thing. And then next time it comes, next time we got to go out, it's like, well, last time I did X. And you were fine with it. So it should be fine this time. Yet not trusting that we won't be bringing that kind of energy or using that kind of coercion, for lack of a better yeah. word, right, yeah. um, on them, that it truly is about um, consent, but working together and trying to figure out a way to make it work. And yes, definitely the go on the around and around individually, because they were such different processors. Right. right. And it just took some needed longer conversation, some needed space to think more. And I could be there with them and give them that space and engage with them and pick out what they've shared. And then I can go to the next person and share it in their language. Right. Because they may not yet understand no matter their age. <laughs> understand the other person's language and what it actually means so I could understand each each person's language and reframe what other people are saying not in their words but in the words that would be meaningful or understood by the other person and then that was just it was just the most beautiful investment I felt and be beautiful use of my time and energy because it helped us, like like you mentioned, Sarah, you know, we're also telling them 
you know, about their sibling or, you know, their other parent or myself, you know, what we're feeling, thinking, how we're experiencing it. So they're learning about us too, everybody else too, at the same time that they're taking the time in the conversation to understand themselves and how they're feeling affected or what their needs are they're feeling right in this moment or their constraints that they're feeling so they're mm -hmm. also figuring themselves out and I'm learning more about them it's just this kind of beautiful spiral that yes it takes time but as you've said so many times Anna that's my time that I'm investing up front versus the time that I'd have to invest later if we just kind of plowed ahead did the thing and then we had meltdowns and upsetness yeah that we'd have to process through after. So it's not yeah. like I do it or I don't do it. <laughs> yeah. avoid you'll, it but... you'll spend the energy one way or the other. Yeah, <laughs> I would always rather have those conversations where I'm learning about them and they're learning about me versus trying to manage energy and make repairs and do all the things mm -hmm. afterwards, which sometimes we get in a place where we have to do that. I think we'll talk about those in those next two yeah. spots that you're talking <laughs> to talk about. Yeah. But, you know, if I can avoid it with some, you know, connection and stuff up front, then I will. <laughs> that is just mm -hmm. me. And this is where I think I wanted to throw in uh, the second resource that I, oh, sure. I have read like the first 25% of this book, but just knowing that it's there, it's really been helpful. And it's the will it's, it's, are you willing by Marion Rose? And she has a willingness practice. And so this is where for me, I haven't actually used Marion Rose's specific practice, but she walks through like her willingness practice. Um, but what's been helpful for me is, um, you know, I've glanced through it and been like, oh, I can do this for myself to get my, not get myself somewhere, but to see if I can arrive at a, at a willing consent, for example. And I just did it last week when Ryan wanted to make homemade dog food. Um, and I really wanted to want to do that. But I noticed that I felt some heaviness and some resistance. And so with this willingness practice, instead of being like, oh, I'm just going to ignore that I'm feeling a little heavy and tense about some things nebulously and just go do the thing. I knew that that tightness would come out somehow in my interaction while, while I was doing this dog food with him. And so I sat down and I'm like, what, what am I trying to protect? Like, why am I feeling tight? And I realized, oh, I was feeling tight because I was worried that if I made dog food, I'd be too tired to make dinner and that I'd be on my feet a lot. And that that would mean that I would do this one type of cooking, but then I couldn't provide for myself and then the family later on. And then I was able, recognizing that, to come up with some ideas that would tend to care for those things while I was making dog food with Ryan. So I was like, well, if I get tired on my feet, I could, he's pretty self-sufficient. I could just sit, pull up a chair and sit. And also while he's making dog food, I could do some things that prepare me for my meal. So I'm not just like, I'm prepping for the dinner while, you know, by cleaning up or whatever. And so then I, I worked through that, those tight spots and that friction to finally, I, I came to this point where I was like, yes, I would like to do that with Ryan. And it was this light kind of like, and there's nothing that is feeling tight or tense or heavy to me about this. Yes. And that's where I knew, but that's where the time I feel. And I felt like it was so worth that upfront kind of willingness work that I did. Um, because then when it came time to make that homemade dog food with Ryan, I was having so much fun and there was no like, me snipping about like, oh, you made a mess here and now I got to clean it up. And it was just really light and it felt really nice. And I knew I had cared for myself as well in this kind of activity that I didn't choose for myself. Yeah. I mean, that to me really sounds like kind of my practice of like getting to the underlying need, right? Because we can have this first reaction of like, I don't want to do this. I want to do this. But then when we get to the underlying need, then because that's so, of course, it's like, yeah, I want to be able to make dinner later or I don't want the kitchen disaster because, you know, I need the clean surface to start making dinner. You know, just knowing those things about myself and being able to articulate it at times too. Like it sounds like that may have been a more internal process for you, but I found there was times it was helpful for me to kind of articulate that process of me getting to my underlying need depending on the situation because it helped 
them do the same. So it's like, oh, I want to make this special treat for the dog because I'm really excited about something with Toby. Okay, that we might be able to do a different way. Or no, it's this specific recipe that I want to make. You know, then we're having a conversation where I think more solutions and creativity can come in versus just staying up here with make the dog food, don't make the dog food. So I like that. But it is interesting to kind of tie it into this willingness piece. And so it sounded like, yeah, there was a, and the tool. Do you want to share the tool with, with that? Well, or is no, that not it's really part just, of it? It's really just, just that um, the process. book, Are You Willing? So if people are curious of like, well, what does that even what does that even right. look like? And so Marion Rose, she laid it out, I thought in a really beautiful way on like, what do you ask yourself? Like, what do you kind of sense? Like, where's your tightness? Do you have a part at play? And like, how do you care for that? And then find either your willingness or you might actually arrive at actually, no, I, right. I'm actually not willing and here's why. And can we do it a different time or whatever, which is yeah. fine too. And that's but okay I'm, too, right. Pam, I think something you mentioned, I think, so I've been playing around with this, like, there are certain things that I know are going to happen where I can kind of maybe do some willingness work up front before the event. And I knew like this thing with Ryan, yeah. like he had already been like, we would, I want to do it tomorrow. And I was like, okay, I'm feeling a little tight about that. So I knew like, okay, I would like to maybe do some internal yeah. willingness work here. But I think where I do a lot of the verbal processing, like what you were talking about is when someone comes to me and it's more like, I haven't had that upfront prep. And then, but I'm noticing I'm feeling tight and I'll be like, oh, I notice I'm a little tight about that. Let me just give me a moment. I would like to figure out what's happening for me. And it's maybe just like a, give me a moment. If you could just yeah. give me a moment. And then I can kind of, I do sometimes verbally go through, hey, I, I can't do this for you now. Could I do it in 15 minutes? Cause I just finished, yeah. I'm trying to finish this thing. And so it's more like a live action processing um versus like the upfront so I've been playing around with like yeah that makes sense which one do I which ones feel best in the moment for me to try to pull out so yeah yeah it, it depends on the context right how how much time ahead do I know but yes I mean that is one thing that my family has known for many years like they come up it's like okay mom will need a couple of minutes to process and, you know, there are times when I said, you know, like, if you need an answer right away, it's it's no, because that's what I'm feeling. But if you give me a couple minutes to think it through, five minutes, give me five minutes to think it through, then, then we'll see where I'm at. And that was just the processing that you were talking about, Sarah. Like, like what is the context of this? How is this going to, like, spiral out to the rest of the day like if they want to run out and do this thing now and I had a different plan in my head of how the day was unfolding I do need that minute to just play it out in my head and see if anything is affected just like you were talking about like oh yeah okay like in that kind of situation I might think oh I'm going to think of like the dinner that I was thinking we'd have in a couple nights, which is like so much easier to make. I'm going to just, I'll switch that up and I'll make an easier dinner. I, it, it's reminded me to think. So now I have in my mind, like you were saying, this is kind of the prep that I can weave into while we're doing, you know, while he's making the dog food, I can weave in some prep because I've thought a little bit ahead of time. I know my window is going to be a bit shorter or my energy is going to be a bit less, et cetera. So I can play with things. But yeah, I really need, and it's just so valuable to have that time just to think things through. And like you were saying, then then we're less snippy or, you know, however that energy comes out. And for me, that is the energy of not, it's of being unsure of how things are going to go. Like, and in when I take that time to process, not only can I go, so if I decide I'm unwilling, but now I know why and I can go and talk to them and maybe we can come up with a plan that shifts my willingness because when I say I'm unwilling because of XYZ impact and they're like, oh, that creative juices because we know we're all on a team and it's not like, no, don't try to convince me otherwise. It's like, no, I'm not feeling able or up for it because of this and this. 
there have been times when they say, well, you can have a long nap tomorrow. There's nothing going on, right? You know, and maybe that is a possibility. <laughs> but everybody's working together. Like we're trying. And even when they say things like that, that gives me a clue about how enthusiastic they are, how important this is right. to them. And I may have thought this was, you know, just an idea that they had. And the more they come up, to try to come up with more ways to make it work, that like gives me more information that, ooh, for some reason, this is more important to them today than it was last week when they wanted to do the same thing or like all those pieces. So it just like brings just so much more information into the context of the, the whole choice and conversation, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the next two... <laughs> We're the unwilling consent and the coerced consent. And um, so just really quickly, so the unwilling consent was when I hope that by saying yes, you'll stop bothering me or think that if I say no, you'll only keep trying to persuade me. Um, I, I don't, I still find myself ever so often dipping my toe into this unwilling consent area. And I know I've done it because I can sense that there's a disconnect that's happened. And for me, I guess first I just wanted to reiterate, like for me, the importance to distinguish between this unwilling consent and willing consent was truly, it's not what it looks like, it's what it feels like. And I don't know who said this, but I loved it so much. It was, the difference is not necessarily one of action, but one of intention and agency. So when you're in the first two categories, people feel like they have agency. The intention is let's keep our relationship. We want us all to be seen and heard. And then when you move down into unwilling consent, not all parties feel like they have agency. Yeah. There's a disconnect happening there, but that could look like anything or nothing at all. So anyway, it's not what it looks like. It's what it feels like. And so where I tend to have kind of little hangups uh, that can happen for me is when I notice that I have an attachment of some kind where I believe that there's a better way or a right way or someone should should be thinking this way. And so when I have this attachment, I've noticed that the stronger my attachment or expectation about something, the harder it is for me to gauge consent in the other person. Mm -hmm. So the stronger I get in like and this is the way it needs to be. I almost have blinders and I can't yeah. actually tell if the other person is even <coughs> consenting to the thing. And so this actually happened to me last week where in consent in conversation, which was a new concept to me just a couple of years ago. It's like, wait, there's consent in conversation <laughs> because my husband revealed a gap in his knowledge. And I was convinced that he needed to know this. Like, oh my gosh, you don't, you need to know this. And so I proceeded to like follow him through the house with all my like talking. I even got out a book. <laughs> and I was like, it's right, it's right here. Look, you need to know this. And then the next day I looked back on it and I was like, I was reflecting on that kind of interaction. And I was like, I have no clue if he actually was interested in anything that I just said there. And I probably, I very well could have gone over his consent to actually want to hear anything that I had to say. And so I, and in that instance, I went back to him and I said, I'm really sorry. I really thought you needed to know this. And I realized, just realized that I didn't even ask you if you were interested. I was like, how did that feel? Did you want to have that conversation? And then that was more like a repair, like, okay, I'm sorry. I, I, but I go there sometimes and I get real sure that I'm right. And by golly, I'm going to chase that person down. And I feel like this happens a lot with kids, like where an adult will say, I have something and you need to hear it, you know, and they just talk at the kid, which I feel like that. Carly Brown kind of wah, 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 wah thing comes in. And, and so I can still tend to do that, not so much with my kids, but I can trip into that with my husband at times and notice that I'm not looking for whether he's really interested in this thing that I feel is really important. Um, and then I had one other, oh, and then the other piece that I wanted to throw in um, was the idea of self-consent. Um, because I feel as though there are so many, I have absorbed many cultural stories, ideas, beliefs, assumptions over the years that 
gave me a script for how I should or ought to act or behave, but didn't actually ask me for my consent or willingness. And I've noticed that that as I've internalized some of these stories and I wasn't aware of them, that I would act in accordance with a story, but I was actually at that point coercing myself into a choice that I, I didn't think I had a choice. Right. And so just this idea that, you know, as we dig into like, and that's where a willingness practice really comes in. It's like, why do, and my red flags for that are like, when I start to say, oh, I have to do this. I ought to do this. I should do this. That's like my kind of red flag for there could be maybe a coercive story or, or some sort of, um, what do they call it? a limiting belief that I'm not aware of happening there for me under the surface and to really why not just to keep peeling back and see where that leads for me. Um, uh, and so I just want to say the repair piece. So I have, and I continue to kind of like notice at times where my energy will kind of, I'll notice I'm pushing. Um, and then on reflection, I'll be like, oh, I just, I wasn't sure if that person really wanted that for themselves. And that's where the repair work comes in. Yeah. And the repair piece is so important. When you were talking about that, it kind of reminded me, you know, Pam, how we always talk about like, if we have this tunnel vision of like to this outcome, that we miss so many signs. And I think you're right. Some of those signs are the people going, wait a minute. (laughs) We don't want to be on the bullet train that you're on, you know, that's ending at this particular place. And so I think that's a really good reminder. And and I think it's interesting that self piece too, because I would say that's probably Probably harder for me. I have I have a really high radar for you know trying pushing through people's consent, and but that piece of when the shoulds happen, and even then, I think the shoulds can tunnel us in. You know, like that. You know, when I'm in my head about that, and then that tunnels me in, I feel like I'm probably missing things around me. And yes, the repair, of course, <laughs> is so and so important. And we we all are going to make repairs. You know, and then that that's a big piece of it, the trust. Yeah, like, like repairs are part of it. It's not yep. like to have an expectation on ourselves that we right. will get good enough that we're never going to need to repair a connection ever again. Um, yeah. That's too much to put yeah. on ourselves. That's not how human yeah. beings, because we all are growing and changing. So what does work in a relationship, in a connection, um, just a way to engage with another person, what works for months then doesn't work, right? And then we need to figure out like a new way. Maybe it's a new way to approach. Maybe it's a new way to have conversations. Maybe they're talking more in this season or now they're not talking so much. So I need to look more for just like clues in their behavior, clues in like their reactions, all those different pieces. So yeah, repair. Repair is fully as important and valuable as the original act of connection itself. Yeah. But yeah. I I also want to know, did I lose it? Um, 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 maybe did I lose it? Anyway, the I did love the story of of you chasing your your <laughs> husband down and just I'm a chaser. Oh yeah, see, <laughs> I got there. I got there. It, that, so there's that piece and that understanding and that tunnel vision, right? Where we just can't see just because we've latched. That's an enth- it was an enthusiastic yes for you right. to share this information, right? Like if we're going to use this framework yet, you know, the processing piece to see, okay, so what is the impact for the people around me with that? And then the, the self-consent piece. I think I that is such a great way to look at it because I don't know if that's, you know, from from growing up in the system, like that piece, I can find myself saying so uh, like you should be able to do this. Like, you know, you have to do this. Like, you just why can't you just get this bit done? And I can't like we can so often, I think, try to like guilt ourselves or try to manipulate ourselves, coerce ourselves nicely. And then to just for ourselves to do these things, but to take that moment to question, am I actually giving consent? Like, is this my inner voice or are these like outer voices in my head that I've absorbed that I'm using totally bypassing my own consent and just like 
I need to do this. There, there's no, I haven't given myself a choice really, right? I'm just trying to find words in my head to convince myself to do this thing that I think I should do, right? Or should be able to do. So yeah, to use that consent framework for ourselves, I think is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> And the last category was the coerced consent. And I will say that since we've moved to unschooling, um, this is not a place that I have gone, honestly. But for the first five years of my parenting journey, I was very steeped in the mainstream ideas of how, what it meant to be a parent and what that parent-child relationship should look like. So it looks for me in the first five years, it might've looked like something like, if you don't eat your vegetables, then you're not going to get ice cream at the end of the dinner. You know, so that kind of coercive way of managing that. Um, and, and it was out of love for that child, believing sure. that that was how to keep them healthy and safe. Um, and so how my kids remember that um, they remember some of the coercion. And so how I, you know, manage that, no, not manage that now, but when something like that comes up, usually they actually are teasing me about it. Um, but I'll, I'll just say, you know, I'm really sorry that, you know, that I, I did that to you. I was doing the best I could. I thought, I thought it was the right thing. I'm really sorry. Cause that just stunk. Um, and to apologize again and just repair and to hear them. And then also to give myself a lot of grace. Um, and because I could beat myself up which I do on occasion, but but usually I was doing the best that I could and with the information that I had and I was an imperfect human and I'm still gonna keep making mistakes. So to really give myself a lot of grace for that time in my parenting journey where you know coerced consent was a part of our daily lives. Um, and I'm just really glad because that was very disconnecting looking back I can see how disconnecting that was. And I'm just so grateful for the path that we're on now because it just feels, it just feels so much. Oh my gosh, it's just so beautiful and amazing. And I just am <laughs> grateful every day uh, for it. So that was coerced consent. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think it is that piece too, that it it we can, if if we find ourselves in that situation, like it, it, you can change at any moment, you can change and you can make those repairs and you can find that way and you can recognize, hey, is what I'm doing creating a disconnect? Is what I'm doing, you know, really impacting this person and even with the best intentions. And again, it's not about beating anybody up or saying that it was, it's, it is just, that wow it, we can make those changes and and come I don't know I, I think it takes a lot to let go of those ideas you know and so I just yeah I just really think that's amazing that, <laughs> that you were able to kind of come from that place that was you know there and just find no this is not how I want to be with my kids it's beautiful I had some amazing guides my kids <laughs> Well, I just wanted to say, though, with with Anna, because sometimes I can feel a little pressured um, because I'm like, oh, I didn't quite do that as well as I would have liked to, you know, in retrospect. Mm -hmm. But then realizing the the relationships I have with my kids are very resilient and they are so willing. Like if I'm honest about what happened and I'm honest about, you know, hey, I, I really did make a mistake here and I know I have more information now and I don't want to make that choice again. They really are so willing to be like, it's okay, mom, you know? And so there's really a resilience in that relationship that allows for these kind of missteps and repairs. And I think it's just, they see you wanting to repair and they see you hearing that. that's that's what I was going to say because I think you're kind of discounting yourself a little too much in that process because that piece of being able to apologize and recognize and make a repair that is not easy for a lot of people Sarah and it it's you know I don't like to say that you know oh the parent did the best they could and it was this abusive you know thing for a long time like no that doesn't cut it you know but but kids it's so it's kids are resilient can also fall into that category that can feel bad but they absolutely notice that authenticity of you coming back and saying, you know what, this didn't feel good to me. And that's what they're recognizing. And that is you being able to say, 
hey, I bought into this and now I'm not, you know? And so I, I just feel like, yeah, I just kind of want to give you kudos for that. And it's, because <laughs> it's not just like a, I don't know. <laughs> it's felt like I need to it's say been that years in the, it's been, we've been homeschooling for eight years now and unschooling for six. And I'd say for that entire time, it has been a very joyfully intense yeah. I, unpacking of all that uh, that I have absorbed all yeah. the years prior to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I do think too, like you, you just mentioned uh, off the cuff a little bit ago about your kids being guided. And this yeah. whole piece was a really big journey, like untangling for me because yes, I could watch my kids doing things and they were in a space where they could make a mistake and it was totally okay. Like I would look, I learned from them. It's like, oh, that didn't work. Even if there was frustration involved, if it was something, they like went back to it and they tried it a different way and they tried it a different way. Whereas for me, it's like, oh my gosh, if that was me, I would be like embarrassed. And, or if I wasn't good at it, I'd want to like, okay, I'm not good at this. Like after 20 minutes <laughs> and just never try it again because I wasn't capable yet. And like to see that that's not the only way. Like I just grew up feeling so like judged and graded and, you know, mm -hmm. you need to get good grades and don't let anybody see you do something that wouldn't be a good grade. Basically, you got to hide those pieces. Right. Mm -hmm. So like looking at them and seeing that in action. And yes, that's what Anna, I think you were meaning like that process of getting to, oh, it's OK to do things and them not quite work out. I can still show up and try something else. I can still show up and repair. I can still show up and, you know, explain where my head was and, but keep showing up. That's the repair piece, I think. It's like, uh, you know, yes. if we have a, a disconnecting moment and I just, for every, you know, maybe we do need a little bit of time to like cool down, et cetera, but the coming back, the repair piece, yes without like judgment even as much as I could without shame like they taught yeah. me not to show up in that moment feeling shame for what happened because what happened is, is you know what happened and we're just gonna like figure out something from there and and move forward and I do think it's so valuable too for our kids to see yeah. us showing up in all the moments so they don't feel like they need to hide the moments that things don't go so well because Oh, things only don't go well for kids. Like when I'm an adult, everything has to be perfect, right? You don't want to be planting those kinds of seeds either. But every experience of us showing up um, to just say, oops, yeah, no, that didn't feel good for me. So, and, you know, sometimes they say, I didn't notice. Like, yes, there were lots of times where they say, I didn't notice because I was the one feeling it. But uh, I could share that. It's like, oh, okay, that's another piece of information for me that, Oh, like we've talked about that before, Anna. Like what the situation was, it's my reaction. Actually, I guess it's not about that situation because what I felt from it is out of step with the other people involved felt from it. So that's just more information for me to process. And oh, so what was kind of triggering that? So yeah, like it is so much about our work to do to get to that spot just because get to that place where we can process and show up and repair because that is a, not a lot of the messages that many of us got growing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I want to tie one quick thing that um, has come up in the network too about this enthusiastic yes, because I think it will be helpful for people to think about when they're going forward. And um, it really came up from Nora McDonald talked about it, but she was explaining some things about what was happening with her kids and recognizing that we she was kind of walking in a place of like the willingness. But then when she saw the enthusiastic yes, it was like, oh, this is really different. So watching for that feel, because you talked about the feel earlier, Sarah, I think it's so important, like, 
oh, this feels different than it, it. Whereas I think, you know, the kind of conversation we had around it in the network was about like, oh yeah, we could get them to the park day or to the co-op or to the thing, but it was hard and it felt a lot and, you know, but we got there and they had an okay time and it was fine. But then when it was the enthusiastic, yes, it was like, they're hopping in the car, they pack their snacks, they're ready to go, you know? And it's like, oh, that's what it can look like. So I think, you know, I just... For me, it's just like, oh, leaving space to, and for me, it's always about slowing it down because I do tend to be the like, go forward, but slowing it down to give those enthusiastic yeses a chance to bubble up so that we can then act on those and find those and go, oh, there it is versus my agenda or what I might be bringing to the moment or what I think we should be doing, which again, you know, I have good ideas, <laughs> but if I'm, if I'm tunneling in, you know, I'm missing some of that. And so I think that was just one of the pieces of kind of this whole framework that you've shared with us that I wanted to pull out, like how it applies, you know, in our kind of day-to-day -day life too, and watching for those enthusiastic yeses from our kids. Yeah, I think that that energy makes such a big difference. And when we, yeah. you know, say, especially when we're first coming to unschooling, I know for me anyway, I had these like great plans. Oh, we'll be able to do this and this and this because we're not going to school anymore. Yeah. And, you know, getting that willingness. Yeah. Okay. We'll go here. Okay. We'll go here. But yes, recognizing all of a sudden when you hit on some, okay, you know, you, they finally suggested something and it's like, wow, what a difference. And to give more space for those things yeah. to bubble up versus always trying to keep us busy so that, you know, yes. it looks good on the outside to maybe other people in our family who don't really understand what we're doing. But if I could list off that we went, you know, these five places over the last seven days, they would be placated. So like that kind of peeling back for myself as to why was I wanting to do these things that I was only getting some, you know, basic willingness to participate and they came along. But that what that did was short circuit a lot of our chance for the more enthusiastic yes, because nobody had the time or the brain space to actually figure out right. what they really wanted to do. <laughs> And there's so much learning in that too, right? Though in the enthusiastic, yes. Because if they're just, if it's a willingness, they're coming along with my ideas. It's really more about me, you know? And even if they're kind of happily willingly coming along, it's still my idea. And so it is short circuiting me learning about the person in front of me as well. Because when they're guided by their enthusiastic, yes, I'm learning what lights them up. And I felt like there are times when, you know, I, my excitement doesn't leave space for that. And so I think that was just a really interesting kind of point around that. All right, Sarah, did we get all your stories today? <laughs> yes, I just wanted to share one more. And this, yeah. I won't go into it in depth. I just wanted to mention it in case folks wanted to read more about consent. It was one more tool. And it was, um, let me see here. It was Betty Martin's Wheel of Consent. And I guess I can hold it up a little bit here for people on YouTube. I don't know. Can you see that? Move yeah, serve, take, yeah. accept, Move allow. <laughs> yeah, there so you basically... Go. It's a wheel broken into four quadrants that show kind of the different relational experiences that we might have mm -hmm. falling into four categories of serve, take, allow, and accept. And um, again, it's Betty Martin was focused on physical touch, but I have just found at times it's so helpful, especially when I'm having a hang up in a certain area to kind of come back to this graphic and be like, oh, I'm having a trouble in the allowing quadrant. And it really kind of, um, helps me focus on that. And so um, she wrote a book, um, Betty Martin wrote a book called The Art of Receiving and Giving that really goes into the wheel of consent in depth. And then it's also available online. Um, and I just wanted to point to that because it's just been another framework that I've looked at and gone, oh, and then there have been aha moments just speckled throughout just by seeing this one graphic. Um, so I wanted to share that as well, but not go into um, any more depth. Yes, no, thank you. And we'll put all the resources in the show notes so that people can link to these different authors and these different concepts because it is really fun to dig into all of it. Yeah, it is. It is. It's so, so interesting just to like take one lens and and look yeah. at things through that uh, that eye, that framework. So thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. 
And to our listeners, we hope you enjoyed our conversation and maybe even picked up a nugget or two for your unschooling journey for your relationships and just using that consent lens in all sorts of aspects. Like I love so much that the the resources you've been sharing, Sarah, were actually, you know, written in more of, you know, sexual uh, framework of consent, yet it it really works in the relationship framework mm-hmm. and it really works for all ages. Yeah. All our relationships, Definitely. our adult relationship and our relationship. Well, what do you want to say? One quick thing. Because, because like, that's the thing that's so important about consent. Like if we're not learning about it when we're young, if we're not experiencing this with relationships, if we're not understanding these pieces, why do we think that at 18, these young men, women, and people are going to get it and then be able to have relationships that have consent? No, like it starts so much earlier than that. And so that's why it's such a kind of a passion area for me. Because I think it's it's it really is the seed of then what creates these healthy relationships in adulthood. For sure. All right. Well, if you enjoy these kinds of conversations, I think you would love the Living Joyfully Network. It, it is such an amazing group of people connecting and having thoughtful conversations just like this, all about the things that we encounter in our unschooling lives. And you can learn more at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash network. We hope to meet you there. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>